Well, it was a Sunday morning, the 28th of November, 1965. I was a flight leader on a strike mission on North Vietnam. As I came from the sea, and I crossed the beach, I approached the target area, I took two hits somewhere aft, and I knew, because I had a lot of time in the airplane, that my airplane had suffered a mortal blow. Well, the airplane was, was out of control, so I pulled the ejection curtain and left the airplane. I made a, a 360 degree turn, and a second or two after I left it, the airplane blew up and exploded. I, an explosion that I knew I could not possibly have survived. I hung limp in my chute. And I think it was there, about a thousand feet in that parachute, that I said my first prayer in 20 years. It was short and simple. Thank you, Lord. I landed in a flooded rice field. The people, of course, all saw me. They were, the militiamen were, were running after me. A couple of dozen of them surrounded me, all armed with knives and clubs. And they took their knives and cut everything I had off of me. And I went to prison. It was Sunday. I had just come home from church. We'd pulled into the driveway, into the garage. Kids got out and were in the house. I got the Bibles and everything out of the car. And another car pulled up behind me. Two of our dear friends got out. I really didn't think too much about it. And then a chaplain got out of the back seat. And then I knew something was wrong. And all I could say was, oh, no, 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 not Howard. The day that Phyllis called and said, Brother Foley, Howard's been shot down, was the day that brought real concern to the hearts of our people, basically me as pastor. And I realized then for the first time that I really had to help our people reach out in a real way to a family that was going to have some need. I came to the, to Hanoi in a truck, blindfolded. I drove up in front of the prison, took my blindfold off, and I saw the Hanoi Hilton. There was no hotel. It was an old French prison. The walls were about 20 feet high, maybe four feet thick. Broken glass upon the top of the wall, hot wires around. There were Vietnamese guards over the place with burp guns. I can't describe. It's difficult to impossible to describe the shock. You cannot appreciate freedom until you've lost it. just wanted to, to be alone because I don't think I had actually realized, it hadn't hit me yet, that uh, Howard wasn't coming back. Or it wasn't just a cruise. The ship was due in in three weeks and that he wasn't going to be on it. For over seven years, I lived in a prison cell, not unlike this one. For almost five of it, I lived alone. And I think I think that I heard someone say that, that a man inside of a prison cell has in there only what he takes in with him, inside. Now, the life generally is monotonous, boring, lonely, certainly. And you establish routines. The food was what we'd have, rotten cabbage soup or sewer greens, as we called them just dumped into a bucket and boiled. There is not any meat in that country. Uh, meat was at a real premium. When Howard was young, he was a very finicky eater, and he loved sweets, and especially chocolate pie. I suspect that we ate dogs. Uh, I don't know what other kind of animals. We could never recognize the animals. We had rats, and these weren't just ordinary little field mice that that you might have seen. These were, 
These were rats, over a foot long from nose to tail. And I, I used to get the idea that, that, they, that one would sneak out under the door and, uh, and go out into the passageway and, and call for the cat. They hear Kitty Kitty. He was ready to take on a cat. They were that big and they were that strong and tough looking. There was constant diseases. Uh, we worried about every, th every move we made. Uh, if we stumped our toe, it took a month to heal. Uh, we could take charcoal uh, to stop a, a dysentery or diarrhea. We might take, uh, uh, if we could, steal a, a teaspoonful of kerosene for a flush out of the system of parasites or worms. You, you try and prepare yourself for some, something like this, particularly when you're a service wife, but you never think it's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to somebody else. You, you're never in that category. And then when it really does happen to you, you're not ready for it. And I, like I did that, and I said, well, why me? What had, uh, what had we done that it would happen to us? And of course, one of the, the more important things that, that we could not permit them to do was to keep us alone. And we knew because we could hear sounds on the other side of the wall, there was another man in a cell just like this one. Everything we could do, every sound that was legal, we could convert into a communications effort. Now, I understand there was usually a guard right outside the door. And uh, we had to be very careful. I, uh, our primary means of communication, there would be a, we'd have a tin cup, this wall tapping and, and talking into the cup and with the cup. This was no game that we played. This was deadly serious. It was hazardous. It was risky. But to get the man on the other side of that wall, on the line, bring him into our communications network, give him some strength of purpose, let him know that there were others around him who were in the same situation that he was. It was a question of, of life or death in many cases. Just to, to let him know that we were together, even though we were separated by a foot and a half of brick. Everything we could do to communicate with one another, because communication was our lifeblood. For some reason or other, when things like this happen, people will avoid talking about him or whatever the tragedy may be. They'll talk about anything else but that, and I guess they feel like that they're doing you a favor, but that's really not what you want. That, that's what you want to talk about more, is, is him. On 4 August of 1966, I, it, it came my turn to, in the barrel, as we say, and I, the, the Vietnamese wanted to use me on film and sound. They wanted me to confess that I was a criminal and condemn my government. And they put me into a little place we called the outhouse. It was one of their torture rooms. They, there was no bunk in this outhouse. There were no windows. It was just a, a tiny, small, filthy cell. They took my hands and crossed my arms and tightly bound me in handcuffs behind my back. And I spent I guess more than three weeks in this condition. I sat on the floor and I lived in my own excrement for, for these weeks. And I wasn't the first one who had been here. There were other Americans here before me that had lived just as I had and they never cleaned this place. And ultimately, this and the heat, the vermin were finally getting to me. I began to lose what I'd describe as rational thought. I knew that I had four children, but I, I couldn't think of their names. I could remember only my wife, Phyllis, and I could pray. And I repeated her name over and over again, and, I, and it was, I think, that night that I committed myself on my return, and I knew I was going to, to rededicate my life Christ, enter my church, and indeed on the first Sunday that I was home, I was going to, to, to walk down the aisle and, 
and join the church with my family. It wasn't a deal that I made with God. It was, it was something that I knew I had to do. And I knew it was somewhere near the end of my rope. And he answered those prayers and saw me through a, a hideous experience that I, that I now wish to forget. We prayed for Howard every week, every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. His name was called unto God in prayer. And our people would pray in their homes for Howard, and they would call me on the phone and remind me that they were praying for Howard. Phyllis went through some rough days, and had it not been for the prayers of Christian people and the concern that they showed her, she just wouldn't have made it, really. It was July the 4th. We were on a picnic at the beach, and John liked to, um, he and his cousin had a game that they played, see which one could hold the breath the longest underwater. This time, they didn't realize something was wrong until they, one of the boys, some boy standing there saw blood on the water. <laughs> We saw a, a boy dragging John, and we found out that he had hit his head on a rock. The police were called, and we took him to a hospital that was close by into the emergency room where they examined him and uh, said that uh, he was very severely injured, and he was operated on that night. And uh, afterwards, they told us that he would live, but that he would be paralyzed for the rest of his life. It was a terrible blow. This was our only son. I thought really more of John's life of head, uh, the things that he was going to miss, never being able to walk again and do the things that uh, young boys would that experience because he had just uh, turned 15 and was really starting into some of the best times of his life, a teenager going into high school. I was just going to go dive, you know, diving and swimming around with my cousin. And I dove in the water and evidently I just hit a rock on the top of my head and it just kind of came to my neck just like a hose would cut off the water. and. Uh, Fortunately, I didn't go unconscious, and I knew what was going along. And I guess here again, it's just where um, our faith and the way things had just happened. There just happened to be, there was no lifeguard there. But there was a doctor who was also on a picnic, who was right there, who knew a lot about neurology and everything. So it was just, as things went along, it just fell in place. I really hadn't made any church friends to a certain degree other than our, our pastor. And I sort of drifted away. But they did keep visiting. And some of my Sunday school teachers uh, always called or dropped uh, a card in the mail or they would come by. And through my uh, two youngest girls uh, got interested in the choir. And we started going back to church, which I finally realized uh, that that's where I should have been all the time, because you get your, your best uh, friends, your best encouragement. People seem to say the right things to you from uh, the friends that I had made at church. And they never pressured. They just uh, would say, uh, God does answer prayers. It may take a little while, but, but he does answer prayers. You just have to sit and wait on them. It's hard, but uh, it will eventually come true. I would turn to God in prayer. And this, I made mean, it, it was a daily, a daily routine with me. And it was 
reaching back into my memory from 20 or 25 years earlier into the church that I joined when I was a youngster and a church that I had not attended for almost 20 years before I was shot down and captured because I had dropped out and drifted away from the church. But I just paced back and forth, recalling the, the hymns and the scriptures. And at one at a time, and I've, I found out that, that some of the scriptures that I, could, that I hadn't thought of for so long, that I had all messed up. But I had to meet, and I went over it, and it sustained me for, for many months, thinking about it, trying to figure out what it meant and what he meant when he said it. Can I claim that promise of where you'd bring up a child in the way he should go, and when he was old, he wouldn't depart? The hymns were that I could recall from many years before. When I was a youngster, my, my mother and my father were very active in church in Tulsa. And somehow these stuck in my mind. They were way back, and I hadn't heard of them or thought of them in years. It was Harry who, uh, who gave me a great deal of the scripture, and I'd plug them all in, and he'd tap them out on the wall. Uh, his memory was a great deal better than mine uh, on, uh, on scripture and songs. I'd hear him whistling a tune there at Alcatraz, and, uh, and I'd rap on the wall and tell him, OK, I remember it. What's the name of it? And sometimes he'd say, I don't know. <laughs> that used to be when I was by myself in my church program, and I had, I'd whistle all the tunes, I, all the church <laughs> songs I could recall. During the seven years that Howard was gone, we saw Christ at uh, work in our lives. John was in this convalescent home, surrounded by old people who were dying. It was depressing for him, and he was at that point where we had to do something for him or he, would e he might even commit suicide. So I prayed about it and uh, asked God to show me, to, to, to let me know what I could do for John because something had to be done. I got in my car the next morning and after the kids had gone to school, and just started driving. And I came to this newly opened rehabilitation center here in San Diego. And when I walked into the door, there stood John's doctor. I had been trying to get a hold of him for a long time. And there he was. And that was God working in our lives right there. He was opening the door for us. And in a matter of weeks, John was in one of the most advanced rehabilitation hospitals in the United States. It, it just had to be God. After about five years, they put us together in one large camp. And I was in a... Uh, a cell block where there were 45 to 50 other men. We kind of felt that perhaps the end was coming. This was January of 1971. And one of the first things that occurred during that, that uh, communal living was that we wanted to hold a worship service. Faith was a constant part of our lives. Without faith, it would have been difficult to carry on, if not impossible. We had to have faith in God and faith in many other things, but faith in God was primary. We talked about God without shame, openly. We talked to people who hadn't talked about God perhaps since they were children. We, no one went around preaching God, but he was a common, he was a topic of conversation. See, we learned to reduce things to their basics there very quickly. God was one of the th first things that we learned was important to our existence. Each week, each Sunday, we were going to have our church. And the Vietnamese did not want us to have church. Uh, they uh, felt like that uh, it was a political indoctrination. They did not want one man addressing the group. But we were going to have our church regardless, and we did. Well, I had the great honor and privilege of taking part in that service, and my part was to recite 
quote the 101st Psalm, which I had been able to put together to the best of my ability and my memory over the previous five years alone. Well, the Vietnamese tried to interrupt us. They came in and hollered at us for to stop, but we didn't. We kept on. We received a lot of letters from uh, people all over the United States, in Guam and Hawaii, that were wearing the bracelets, the POW-MIA bracelets. And um, they were wearing Howard's bracelet. But of course, the main letter that I was looking for was this one from Howard. And I finally received it after five years, a long five years, to let me know that uh, he was alive and that he was as well as could be expected. He has a very distinct handwriting. It's a beautiful handwriting. So that I knew that it would never, it, nobody could copy it. That I knew that when I received that letter, I'd know it was from Howard. And this is it. And it was only six lines long but it meant everything in the world to me. I wouldn't give anything for it. Uh, that was the sacred hour to me because there was my son coming back to life. That was a very frightening and scary point for me because I was in a wheelchair and we had had to write letters and updating him on family events. And I guess we were one of the, I guess the only family that I had had something peculiar like this happen. And um, I didn't know whether or not he was going to come and come back in worse condition than me, whether I was going to be in worse condition than he was, or how he would feel about it. Howard was coming back really was coming back. In fact, he was going to be on the plane in the next day or so. And I turned to the people and shared this information with them. And the joy, just the exhilarating joy in the hearts of the people, I'll never, 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 maybe never see it again just like that. They had really seen another evidence of how God answers prayer. Word came of our release. It was going to be a release with honor. And as those prison doors came shut, I walked out a free man. I knew that I was going to be home to a normal life, I hoped, although a changed one. My family had grown up without me. We landed at Clark Air Force Base, and I learned of my son John's accident. And now I I would gladly have gotten back on the airplane and flown back to Hanoi and stayed there for the rest of my life if I could have restored my son. When they signed the treaty, I was, I finally let go. I was just, I couldn't believe it. And then it, I think, waiting from that day until the day he arrived was probably the longest wait over the whole five, five, seven years. In the service, when I introduced him and he stood, people just automatically stood with him. It was tremendous. Of course, the auditorium was filled and people were just overjoyed. They had come to the place in their life uh, where they knew now that God answered prayer. Here was an evidence of it. And then when the invitation was given and Howard kept his promise to God that he made in Vietnam there in prison to walk down that aisle and rededicate his life and uh, commit his life to Christ in a full sense. And it was just um, fantastic the way that he accepted my disability to begin with, and how since then, when we've been able to talk, that it necessarily hasn't just been centered around being paralyzed. It's about what you can do with your life, still. No matter how much time you've lost or gained, such as eight years in a prisoner of war camp, or by being paralyzed, it's what you think in your mind and how you can apply it. See, I was at church when I found out that the POWs were coming home and we had that, fortunately it was that night that Brother Foy said, has anybody got anything to praise the Lord for? So I was like, wow! <laughs> I just, I want to praise the Lord for having Dad come home finally and that, 
and that we once can be a family again. I just went, I was like, oh, I was so happy. I, could, I just couldn't stifle myself. Then I had to sit down. I was talking too much. <laughs> I was happy. I was really happy. Captain Howard E. Rutledge. So I had to really touch him to know that uh, that he was home. And I could see him, I could feel him, I could touch him, and that's what I was really waiting for. Perhaps it is that some of you, as well as I, have prison memories, but a different kind of prison where the walls were made of hate or anger and the bars of greed or selfishness and the solid steel doors of apathy and unbelief. If we were drowning ourselves in self-pity for our own pain and suffering, then we were reminded that Christ, our Lord, had suffered so much more. I believe that Jesus came, that he lived, that he suffered and died, so that all of us could be free. Let us join together in celebrating his triumph over death and praising him who with his life has freed us all. <laughs> 